Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. You may stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And I will have Utah. The land of Judea, just outside Jerusalem, on the road to Bethlehem. Because of a census ordered by Roman officials, people all over Judea must return to their ancestral homes. Among those many travelers are Mary and her husband, Joseph. Their destination is Bethlehem, 80 miles to the south of their home in Nazareth. Mary, let's stop just for a moment. I'm fine, Joseph. We want to make good time. Normally, the journey would take just four or five days, but Mary was expecting a child. Bethlehem isn't going anywhere. It'll still be there when we arrive. Yes, and all these people will also be there when we arrive. Don't worry, I have relatives there. We'll stay in an inn until we can track them down. Everything will be just fine. As she has done many times over the last few months, Mary finds herself reflecting on what has brought her to this point. I know, Joseph. I know. As a young woman in the small village of Nazareth, she expected an uneventful and traditional life. She and her husband Joseph were betrothed, meaning they had been bound together in the marriage contract. But they still lived apart from each other, with their own families. Following tradition, they both waited for the night that Joseph's father would send him to get Mary. Then, there would be a second, even bigger ceremony, and Joseph would take Mary home with him to be his bride. This specific part foreshadows the rapture spoken of in the book of Revelation, when God the Father would send Jesus to get his bride, the believers. This is still to come. Mary, I saw Joseph working on your new home yesterday. Your parents were wise to marry you to a carpenter. He's a good man. That he is. Their life together would begin. Mary knew that Joseph, a hard worker and godly man, would make for a wonderful husband and father. They planned to live in the house Joseph built near his family's Nazareth home, fill it with children and grow old together. But those were the plans of a young man and woman and those plans were about to change dramatically. 
Greetings, Mary. What, what do you want? You have nothing to fear, Mary. Indeed, you have found favor with God. You will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus. What, me? Yes, you. He will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of King David, from whom you are descended, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. But how can this happen? Joseph and I have not, are not yet, I'm still a virgin. Mary, the Holy One you will give birth to will be the Son of God, and nothing is impossible with God. Even Elizabeth, your cousin, old as she is and barren since her youth, is also a child. I, I, I am the Lord's servant. Mary's life was not the only life to be disrupted by the angel's news. Joseph, I need to speak to you. Mary, look, I've figured out where we will build on when we have children. And I need to know where you wanted the fire pit. Hmm, you seem to be in a bit of a tizzy. What's wrong, Mary? Don't worry, I'll have this place prepared in record time for our marriage ceremony. Joseph, I'm not worried about that. I have something important to tell you. And so Joseph listened as she told him everything. And I carry the baby now, Joseph. Hmm, you expect me to believe this? I have spent so much time and strength building this house for you and for our children. Oh, get out of here, Mary, please. Soon afterward, Mary went away to her cousin Elizabeth's home in Judea, a town in the hill country outside Nazareth. Thank you for walking with me, Zacharias. Is Elizabeth's baby? You're not going to answer me, are you? Mary, my precious little cousin. Hello, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, is something wrong with Zacharias? He didn't say a word. Oh! Elizabeth, is it the baby? Yes, yes, but not like you think. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary, you are the most blessed of all women, and blessed is the child in your womb. But I too am blessed, for I have standing in my own house my cousin, the mother of my Lord. Oh, Elizabeth, how, how did you know? Mary, as soon as your words reached my ears, the baby in my own womb leapt for joy. We have much to talk about. So I was very glad when you asked me to come here, Elizabeth. Joseph could have demanded that I be stoned to death, but he thinks a quiet divorce is the best way. He's not marrying an adulterer, and I can have the baby and live with my family. He is a good man, Mary. Give him time. You asked if Zacharias was okay. Did you know that he too received a visit from an angel? Zacharias and I never had children, but not because we didn't want them. We tried, we prayed, and we just eventually gave up. It just wasn't our lot in life, we decided, trusting God that there was a purpose. But when Zacharias was in Jerusalem for his regular duties as a priest, he was selected by lot to go into the holy place in the temple to keep the incense burning. Priests enter the holy place alone, but suddenly my Zacharias found himself with a companion. There is nothing to fear, Zacharias. Your prayers have been answered. You and your wife, Elizabeth, will soon have a son. You will give him the name John, and he will bring joy to your house. Many, many people will rejoice because of his birth. He will bring people back to the Lord their God, and he will go forth with the power and spirit of Elijah. He will turn disobedient hearts toward righteousness, and he will get the people ready, preparing the way for the Lord to come. And so my husband, the priest, you know, my husband, the rabbi, he says to this messenger from God, How can this be? My wife and I were old. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, who has sent me to speak to you and tell you this. 
Now you will not speak until it all comes true, because you did not believe me. It took me a while to get the story, since he can only communicate with hand signs and writing. But what the angel said has come true. Zacharias can't speak, and a child grows in my womb. My Zacharias, he has learned his lesson. Your Joseph, he will too. I hope so, but I know what he thinks of me. God will not keep the truth from him, and when the truth is revealed to him, your Joseph will want to serve the Lord just as you do. I, I hope so. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months. In due time, Elizabeth gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives, knowing God had shown her great mercy, shared in her joy. On the eighth day after the boy was born, he was taken to be circumcised. I had hoped Zacharias would be speaking by now. I wanted to hear him tell about his encounter with the angel. I was just hoping he'd be able to speak at the circumcision. And I presume the child will be named Zacharias after his father? No! John! His name is supposed to be John. But there is no John in his family that I know of. Is there a John in yours? No, but he must be named John. Shouldn't you give him a good family name? I don't think I know anyone with that name. Zacharias, what do you think of this? Someone please get Zacharias a writing tablet. Unable to speak, Zacharias begins to write. And what he writes is, his name is John. To the high priest finally gives in. Very well then, John it is. Ah, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has redeemed his people, and you, my son, will be the Lord's prophet, preparing people for the Lord's salvation and forgiveness. And everyone in the area was filled with awe and talked about all that had happened with Zacharias and Elizabeth. Back in Nazareth, Joseph continued to face what had once been unthinkable. He thought his plan was good. It spared Mary's life and allowed him to remain righteous before the Lord. But why did it feel wrong? Lord, what am I supposed to do? This house was supposed to be our house, our life. How could she ruin it like this? Show me. Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. She speaks the truth. The child in her womb is of the Holy Spirit, and she will give birth to a son. You, Joseph, are to give him the name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. What? Then it seemed the angel disappeared right before his eyes, yet he was still dreaming. When Joseph awoke, he could barely articulate what he had just experienced. What happened? When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord commanded him. Hey everyone, I just wanted to share, uh, when I started attending church, and everything was so new to me. I was surprised at how many words they used that I really didn't understand. I was very young at the time. Like if sin meant bad things, why didn't people just say bad things? Why'd they have to use this new word, sin? But sin actually means it's those things that are against the Ten Commandments. Here are some other words that I heard in the church that at the time of being a new Christian, I did not know the meaning to. Prophet, rapture, tribulation, blessings, Prayers, baptize, anoint, New Testament, eternal life, heaven, hell, Jesus, Christ, Messiah, Holy Spirit, faith, resurrection, Lord, glory, grace, advent, altar, apostle, disciple, atonement, cherub, idolatry, incarnation, prodigal, prophecy, repentance, sermon. Many people don't even know the meaning behind the Gospels. I understand this, because as a kid, if I heard this word, I understood it was a religious word, so I wasn't interested. 
The Gospels are the first four books written in the New Testament. They detail where Jesus came from, where he went, what he did, and what he taught. So I've just read in this episode part one of the Gospels as depicted in the Keystone Bible. What they did was combine the four Gospels into one narrative. Bible scholars have done this first and proved that each one of these four books about Jesus from four different perspectives fit together flawlessly. This has been done on websites and in countless books. Though reading this version from the Keystone Bible is a real treat, it should not replace the profound experience of reading the Gospels separately from a traditional Bible. Thank you very much and I hope you are blessed with this, the greatest account ever recorded. Profound proof of God is located in Bible prophecies. There are countless prophecies in the past that span across vast distances of time and are accurate to fine details. There are prophecies that pertain to our present age and there are prophecies that reveal our future events to come. You might think that Christians pray for signs, wonders, and visions, but come up empty-handed. But this simply is not true. Let me share some of the proofs of God that really blew my mind. At the end of each gospel part in these episodes to come, I urge you to stay tuned to the end to learn incredible facts that no one can deny. Everyone recognizes that if a person or a book could accurately predict the future and be correct every single time, not 50%, not 75%, but 100% of the time, then that person or that book would have to have divine help. That is superhuman. Humans just cannot do that. Is there a book that does accurately predict the future and get it right 100% of the time? Yes, there is. It's called the Bible. And it contains scores of amazing prophecies that prove it to be from God. Number one, the fall of Tyre. In the year 597 BC, the prophet Ezekiel made a bold proclamation against the city of Tyre. At the time, the city was one of the wealthiest and most secure cities in the entire world. It had massive walls. It also had an island city that the inhabitants, if they were attacked, could go out to that island city. Yet for all that, Ezekiel predicted several things that would happen to Tyre. He said that the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar would come up against the city, that he would build siege mounds against the wall and the city's walls would be broken down. He predicted that many nations would come up against the city and the city would be scraped clean like a rock. He predicted that its stones and its timber and its soil would be thrown into the sea. How are you going to get the stones and timber and soil of a huge city like Tyre thrown into the sea? As we look at history, secular history provides the answer for that. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, did come up against the city of Tyre. He did exactly what Ezekiel predicted, but it didn't stop there. Because after he built a siege mound against Tyre, the inhabitants moved out to the island city and he couldn't attack it. And yet, in about 330 BC, a man by the name of Alexander the Great attacked Tyre. And the inhabitants did the same. They went out to that island city, but Alexander the Great wasn't happy with a simple victory over the mainland city. He took the rocks and the timbers and the soil and scraped them clean, dumped them into the sea, and made a causeway out to the island city. How could Ezekiel have looked into the future more than 250 years and predicted what would have happened? Divine assistance. 